today's conference has been videotaped by MCAT, and so you'll be able to catch any panels you might have missed rebroadcast on MCAT. So, um, okay. Okay, good. To my immediate left is Alice Bolin. Uh, she earned her MFA from the University of Montana in Poetry in 2011. She's a nonfiction contributor to publications including The All, The LA Review of Books, which I'm totally jealous of, Salon, The New Yorker's Page Turner blog, The Paris Review Daily, and Vices Broadly. Her poems have appeared in Guernica, Blackbird, Washington Square, The Hayden's Ferry Review, and Octopus, among many other journals. Her first chapbook of poetry, Motel Diary, was published by Poor Claudia in 2014. She lives in Southern California, where she's the poet in residence at the Idlewild Arts Academy. Caitlin Stankin, the next one down, is a writer and performer who's won recognition for her work in theater and film. Originally from San Antonio, she lived and worked in Boston and Chicago before moving with her husband to Missoula, Montana. She received an MFA in fiction from the University of Montana in 2014 and works in sales at Submittable. Julia Mays is the executive direct assistant for VidCon, the largest online video conference in the world, and NerdCon Stories, an event that celebrates the art of storytelling in all its forms. She came to Montana for school via Washington State, got a degree, and never left. <laughs> oh, I think it's too soon to say never. No. Your stu <laughs> has not yet left, maybe. Sure, okay. Uh, the Dan Brooks, a.k.a. A Typhoid Mary, is the <laughs> next one down. He's written for a living since he left New York City in tw 2009. His essays have appeared in the New York Times, and he won the 2015 Associated Association of Alternative News Media Award for his column in the Missoula Independent. He holds an MFA from fiction from the University of Montana and a BA in theater and English from the University of Iowa. Probably he should have studied computers. I think that, that joke was enough the it first time I told it. Time. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Amanda Fortini, the last, the last down, it's written for the New York Times. The New, York, the New Yorker, Rolling Stone, The New Republic, New York Magazine, Slate, and Salon, among other publications. She's a contributing editor at Elle Magazine. Her essays have been widely anthologized, including, including an American best, best American Political Writing and Best of Slate, and she was nominated for James Beard Foundation Journalism Award. She currently divides her time between Livingston, Montana, and Las Vegas, Nevada. So, our panelists. Um, this is called Getting Started, and I think that the, the idea for this panel was fairly simple. Uh, w we have this incredibly accomplished group of panelists up here, um, and then there's you out in the chair wondering how to get from that side of the table to this side of the table. And so I think that's what I wanted to focus on, is what can, how, how we all got our start and what kind of concrete things you could do to try to move from being a student into being uh, more, more in the professional world. So I was kind of hoping each of you could tell your origin stories <laughs> as, we went, as we went through this. Um, am I beginning? Yes. Please. Uh, <laughs> even in alphabetical order, you come first. Thank you. Um, I should add to my already too long bio that uh, I also edit a journal called Oki Panky. Um, which is an offshoot of electric literature with three other graduates of the MFA program here at Montana, Ed Skoog, J. Robert Lennon, and Rian Ellis. And you should look us up, ogiepanky.com. Um, I definitely should have included that in my bio. Um, I graduated from here five years ago in poetry, and then I waited tables, I worked at the writing center, kind of like drifted around in my car. So um, I definitely, like when I graduated, didn't have much of a plan of what was gonna come next. I was sending my poetry manuscript out and not too much success as far as that went. So I was kind of like, well, okay, that was my plan was to like get my poetry manuscript published and become famous. So that didn't happen, but um, then, when I was still living in Missoula, uh, I started, well, I would say like two things happened. I was tweeting a lot, and I still do that a lot. And um, that actually is like, a, like, even though it sounds very trivial and 
silly. Uh, it's a really uh, the way that I made a lot of networking connections, um, got a lot of opportunities. Editors found me there. My agent found me on Twitter. Um, so it actually hasn't been a trivial part of my writing life at all. It's been a huge way that I network and promote my work. And also, I started writing uh, nonfiction, mostly just because I felt like it, I wanted to. And I had all these ideas I wanted to write down. So it wasn't really a way, for me, it wasn't a strategy to make money. It was just kind of something I felt like. And I've published a lot on the internet, and I found that there's a lot of instant gratification as far as that goes. People will read it and tell you what they thought of it that the day it's published. Um, <laughs> So uh, for me, both of those things have really contributed to um, me kind of keeping going after the MFA, not giving up writing, and um, yeah, f having you know continued passion for writing. I don't know. That's it. Do you, do you have that one? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah, they all work. Okay. Um, so my name's Caitlin, and um, I mean, I've never really had a, had a plan at all. <laughs> so my plan is always just kind of to do whatever the most interesting thing or the most exciting thing at that moment seems to be. Um, so for me, I started, um, after I got my undergrad degree, I moved to Chicago uh, because I had a cousin who lived there who was in theater, and he was doing a lot of really interesting things. And he kind of introduced me some, to some people there, and uh, I ended up trying out I, I auditioned for a position as an ensemble member with the Neo Futurists in Chicago, which are an experimental performance group. Um, I'd never been on stage before that moment, <laughs> but they let me do it anyway, which was insane and great. And that really opened up a lot of opportunities for me in terms of my writing life. And um, I was able to write for theater, and then also some film opportunities came through that, which was wonderful. And then. Uh, after a few years doing that, I met my husband, who's from Montana, and we spent kind of a beautiful, idyllic summer in, in Montana, just kind of camping and hiking and spending a lot of time outside. Um, and so then the most interesting thing to me became getting to Montana somehow. <laughs> and then once, so getting into the MFA program at the University of Montana was the way to do that, and then to also try to focus on writing in particular, because I've done writing and performing up to that point, and I wanted to focus more on my writing. So it was a great opportunity to, to do that, and I took three years to do it, so I had plenty of time. Um, and then I actually saw my, my boss, my current boss now at Submittable, Michael Fitzgerald, he was talking on this panel uh, maybe four years ago. He was here at the, the Writing at Work conference, um, and I heard him talk about hiring people with interesting backgrounds, and I, I thought that maybe I'd have a shot at working there, and he hired me, and, and that's been, I've worked there for uh, a little over a year now. And right now, that's super interesting, but in a totally different way, because it's not writing directly. Um, but it is a growing company that's related to the arts. It, Submittable helps with submission management. Um, if any of you have submitted stories anywhere, you've probably used Submittable. Um, so right now, that's the most interesting thing. And I'm doing that for now, but uh, I really don't have a plan. Uh, I would venture to say that I am possibly an odd duck out because I did have a plan, um, but it totally went to shit. And uh, I got my degree here in English teaching, actually. I have certification to teach uh, 9 through 12, or actually, sorry, 6 through 12, all secondary ed English. And uh, when I was student teaching here at Washington Middle School, they, I loved it, loved that school, loved the faculty there. And they said, if you hang around for five years, a ton of people are going to retire, and you have connections here, you can work here, great. And I was like, okay, Montana's pretty cool, I could hang out here. I, had, I was working as a florist at the time um, when I finished school, and then I realized that YouTube was a thing, and <laughs> this, so when I was in high school and when I was in college, set out to become a high school English teacher, YouTube was not an industry that people worked in. And like YouTube itself, the platform itself had its 10 year uh, birthday last, just last year. And the company that I work for now is only in its seventh year. So uh, by the time this 
sort of offer came around through the weird happenstance connections that you make in a town like Missoula, um, I had sort of resigned to the fact that, yes, I'm nimble and I want to do this cool thing that's been forced onto my plate. And uh, so now I work for a media company, basically. That's the broadest way to describe it. Uh, even though I work for the events arm and I'm an event planner with an education degree. And I understand that doesn't make any sense, but it's what I'm like so, so stoked to be here now that I'm fine with that. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to teach eventually or, you know, later in life, but that's how I ended up here. It was totally a strange thing, weird. <laughs> Uh, I'm Dan Brooks. Uh, thank you for coming out to see me during what I assume are the last hours of my life. Um, I, uh, after graduate school, returned to New York City uh, where I had lived uh, pretty much since college um, and took a job as a tutor for preparatory school students. Um, and once I had sort of socked away enough money to make the transition to writing full time, came here. Um, and in the uh, the early part of my career did not have enough paying work to occupy the entire day um, and therefore started a blog, uh, combatblog.net. If you have a blog, don't admit it to people, it's shameful. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I approached that as a regular practice um, and wrote approximately 800 words in that blog every day uh, for the next uh, I guess until this time, um, so the last eight years. Um, and through that, uh, eventually developed a, a small but select readership um, that began uh, sending real jobs my way, um, including but not limited to my position at the Missoula Independent uh, and my relationship with the New York Times. Um, so that is what I did. Uh, a substantial portion of my practice is still commercial work copy editing and that sort of thing. Um, but very slowly that is, uh, that is ebbing away as more interesting work takes its place. Let's, let's pa pass Amanda one of these other microphones. Uh, yeah, I don't think anybody should be sharing a microphone. Thank you, because I thought it would be too neurotic if I asked no, myself. I, I, I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm certain that having sat next to Dan on two panels today that um, I'm probably going to end up sick okay, myself. Yeah. But um, anyway, I already told my origin myth this morning, so I'll try to, you know, mix it up a little bit for those of you that were here. But um, I most definitely did not have a plan when I first graduated from, from college. Um, I kind of thought maybe I would go back to graduate school and get a PhD. I knew I wanted to write, um, but I wasn't really sure what form, you know, that would take. Um, and But I will say that, and, and when I tell my story, I think it seems um, sort of graced by a lot of luck. I did have a lot of good luck, but I just want to reiterate again that I feel like you can make your own luck. And on the screenwriting panel, they were talking about opportunity meets preparation. I think if there's one thing that has helped me, it's the ability to recognize an opportunity when it comes your way, however small, and to jump on it and take advantage of it. So um, so anyway, I, I graduated from college. I, While I was in college, I um, I wrote a thesis and I won a prize for my thesis that gave me several thousand dollars, so which seems like a lot of money to me. So I used that and I moved to New York City. And once I was in New York, I realized that was not a lot of money and it was going very quickly and um, I had to find a job. So um, I, as I said this morning, I didn't know anybody, I didn't have any connections, so I called a woman that I had met on an airplane. <laughs> and. She was a few years older than me and had gone to the same college as I had, and she was working at a fitness magazine. Um, and sh I went in and spoke to her. She was very nice and brought me in. And I left that morning, that afternoon, whatever it was, with a job. And over the pa next few weeks, I felt like I, had, I didn't have to start right away. I felt really a very nagging thing that this was not the right job for me, that I didn't really, couldn't really see myself. The articles were really about, like, calorie counting and you know how to do certain exercises and things so I called right before the without another prospect on the horizon uh, just knowing that it wasn't right I called and quit the job the weekend before I was supposed to start and as I said this morning the woman the editor-in-chief yelled at me and told me that I would never work in this town again basically 
which I believed. I was 22. So um, I spoke to my friend that I met on the airplane. She, through a connection of hers, put me in touch with um, Barbara Epstein at the New York of Re Review of Books, because I said, she said, where do you want to work? And I said, oh, I'd like to work at the New York Review. So I wrote Barbara a letter, and she called me in for an interview. And it, it, it was sort of like, you know, three and a half minutes, and I wore a suit like I was interviewing to, to work at a senator's office. <laughs> and then I was sort of sent back out on the street. And then she called me the next day and said, you know, her assistant called me. She's looking for some writing samples from you. So luckily, I, I had some, because I had been doing writing on, on my own. I had something to send her when she asked. So I sent that in, and she hired me as an intern. And I worked there as an intern for, you know, probably a year. And at the same time, through another very, very tenuous connection, which is just a friend from college was South African and knew a woman who was from South Africa at Mirabella Magazine. I was brought in for another interview. I sent, sent her a letter, and I got a job and worked at Mirabella. And I would work at Mirabella during the week, and then on the weekends, I would um, go in and intern at the New York Review. Sometimes after I worked at Mirabella, I would go in in the evenings and work at the New York Review. So I was basically working seven days a week. And, but what happened is, I worked at Mirabella for a couple of years. And for those of you who don't know what it is, because it doesn't exist anymore, it was kind of a fashion magazine for intelligent women. It was a very good magazine with good cultural co coverage, and a lot of people um, wrote for it. Like, probably you, Kevin, you know a lot of people who wrote for, you know, a lot of people wrote for Mirabella. Anyway, um, I was there two years, and then and somebody, the, ma the magazine folded. and. The week that the magazine was, which means closed, shut down, and they sort of tell you, you know, without any warning. The week that happened, Barbara's assistant quit at the New York Review, and she hired me to work for her. And I worked for her for four years, and I started as an assistant, and I worked my way up. Um, there's not, it's not a very hierarchical place, so, but I got more, I got more responsibilities, if not, you know, an actual promotion. And then from there, I was hired um, to work as an editor at Slate. Like right when Slate was sort of in its er it was in its earlier days, and I worked there for a couple of years, about three, as an editor again, and that is where I started to write because um, I would spend my days editing, and part of my job description was that I was supposed to write too, and it, it was a full time job, and my boss at the time said, you know, you need to be writing also. And I kind of thought, how am I going to make this work? But what I did was I would edit during the day, and then I would sort of create some kind of transition for myself, eat dinner, you know, light a candle or something. And then I would write from in, during the evenings, every evening, like from like 8 to 2 in the morning, because I, I, I had to write things that they were then published in the magazine. From there, um, people started reading my stuff on Slate. Slate is a really good place to start for young writers. I think that's still somewhat the case. You know, the right people kind of read it. And they're, they're willing to publish young people. And they g give you a chance. And um, I heard that um, the editor of The New Yorker was liking stuff that I was writing. So I sent him a, a query. And he wrote back, like, that day. I sent him an essay that I'd actually written um, and asking if they would publish it. And he said, this is absolutely nothing we would ever publish. But why don't you send me a pitch? And so I wrote a pitch letter for an article. And then after that, two days later, after the weekend, I sent it on a Friday. By Monday, I had an assignment. So my writing life kind of took off from there. And that happened about the time that I, I, I stopped editing at Slate. I just decided that I wanted to write full time and not, not edit anymore. So that's my story. Thanks. I'd share with you my origin story, but it's a little too long. Uh, let's just say that the first line of my resume says BA, University of Montana, 1972-1988. Uh, let, let that sink in for a minute. Uh, so I guess, I, I guess one of the questions that I would do is that if, if, if you are an undergraduate uh, looking, you know, looking to move forward and spend a few productive years between that and your graduate school career, or if you're a graduate student looking who's going to graduate, you know, in a few months or in a, in in you know, 15 months, what are the what what concrete tangible things can you think of to start doing now that might get you to uh, take the, the first steps into the more working world? Any thoughts? Um. I think everyone should work in food service. Uh, <laughs> is Emma's here? That's my girl. 
Um, o. Henry Award winner slash waitress, I'm like Turge. Um, uh, that's actually uh, serious. I think like take whatever job you can. Um, it doesn't have to be in your field and let that inform your life for a while. Uh, be considerate of other people, learn that other people exist, learn that people are different than you, and then go to graduate school. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, um, I think, especially when I was in graduate school, the most helpful thing for me was starting, I mean, obviously writing a lot is important and having a writing practice and not giving up. Um, is incredibly important. But also having a submission practice, um, I think, is also very important. There are a lot of great writers who I know, who I knew in graduate school, who still write and don't send their stuff out. So I'm like, um, what are you doing? Uh, I think <laughs> you've got to get your stuff out there and be meeting editors and making those connections, starting when you know, you're know you kind of a baby writer and um, starting at smaller magazines and working your way up. Um, because, I mean, it's motivating and also it, things actually do come through for you, like Amanda was talking about. When you start publishing, people are reading, even if it doesn't seem like it sometimes. Um, people are out there and that's the best way to make connections in my experience is just getting stuff out there consistently and also, you know, inuring yourself to rejection um, early will help you a lot. See. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, I think there's a tremendous amount of value in taking some time off between your undergraduate and your graduate. If you have that luxury, it's just so much different when you're out in the world trying to do something versus trying to learn about doing something. They're just completely different. Um, and then when you're out in the world, for me, I think, I think like an ongoing challenge is just trying to develop self-awareness because that helps you to recognize opportunities when they come your way. Um, and I think another part of that too is cultivating relationships with people that you find really interesting and the organizations that you find really interesting. Um, and just looking around you and seeing what, what you have at your disposal right now because there's probably a ton. There's probably interesting people around you no matter where you are. Um, definitely if you stay in Missoula, there are. And I think later on that'll, that'll help you in some way that you can't predict right now. Um, so that's what I would say. I would echo both of what these gals said, um, as well as, uh, you know, you're going to be doing some, a lot of professional networking, or at least attempting to, but I think it's important to also foster a personal network and create a support system for yourself so when you are getting uh, job rejections or offer rejections, then you don't fall down into a pit of despair. Um, and then alongside that, uh, I find that practicing self-care is really important and taking breaks from work if you can afford to do so or, um, you know, even, even if that break is an hour or a day, uh, just letting your brain and your heart sort of recharge so that you can face your new work better than if you're burnt out or if you're you know, on the backside of several rejections in a row. Um, I agree with Alice uh, that day job selection is important. <laughs> um, immediately after I graduated from college, uh, my undergraduate degree is in theater, uh, which is why I'm so wealthy now. Um, <laughs> But I took a job uh, with Performance Space 122, uh, which is an avant-garde performance art theater in the, uh, the East Village of Manhattan. It was a wonderful job. I had a great time there uh, and made $21,000 a year, uh, on which I lived in New York City um, as a pauper. Um, and the, uh, it was very similar to what I wanted to be doing. At that time, I was very focused on theater and playwriting, um, and in that way, it was kind of rewarding, but I still, you know, wanted to die. Um, and it was a full-time job that gave me benefits, and in that way it was sustainable. Um, but I was saving like $200 a month. Um, and so like this good enough day job that was kind of in my field uh, ultimately prevented me from pursuing what I really wanted to do. 
Um, whereas if I had been waiting tables or as I later did, like explaining to rich kids the Pythagorean theorem, <laughs> like that gave me a daily incentive to get out of there. Um, so I, I would say uh, if you're looking for a day job, do it for the money. Uh, don't do it for a nonprofit that you care about. Um, <laughs> do it for the money. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on how you're wired and you have to ask yourself that. Like, I found it very difficult to be an editor and a writer at the same time. You would think they would be very similar and they would maybe feed each other, but I really cared about being a good editor and giving a lot to my writers. And, you know, I, I, I was very young and I was able to sort of divide the day in that way where I would just write late at night, but that wasn't really sustainable over a lifetime, you know? Um, and I think that if you can have a day job that is maybe a little bit different from what you're doing um, or that you feel is symbiotic and feeds your work in some way, that's, that's really a, a good thing. Um, uh, it, 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 again, it just depends on, on your particular metabolism. But I would say for young people, you, this is going to sound counterintuitive because we're all here how to, to learn how to you know, do these things, but you don't have to be in a super hurry. Like you can have a life, live, live life, be a real person, have really deep, authentic interests, not just interests that you have so that you can write about them. You know, uh, um, like you can tell a stunt from something that's authentic. And I, I really can tell it when I teach, you know, students that have had some life experiences that have been in the military or have had interesting jobs or have taken a little bit of time, they have things to write about. And I'm not saying, I'm not even talking about it in, t in terms of personal essays per se. Like they've had time to develop themselves as a person and know themselves as a person and know their limitations and know what they're capable of. And, you know, know even having really deep interest, those are the things that you're going to write about if you're writing nonfiction, you know? You're going to go down that rabbit hole of whatever that is. So, um, you know, I didn't get a graduate degree, so I can't really speak to that. And I had another job for, you know, a good chunk of years before I started really writing in any kind of, um, you know, serious making a living kind of way. And I think there's value in that. I think being an editor taught me a lot about how to write and how to deal with people and how to be a human being, which is, like, re really essential for being a writer, being honest and being real. Yeah. I, I know that sounds basic, but. Uh, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking about the fact that I wanted Bill Kittredge's job as soon as I figured out what he did for a living. I thought, yeah, that is a sweet job. And you know what? I was right. Because um, <laughs> I have his, actually, I have Earl Gans's job. But to get from there to here, uh, I was a, a series of long detours. Um, when I was in my 20s, I didn't have the discipline to write. It's pure and simple. The only thing that's between me and not having a writing career is the fact that I spend four hours every morning doing it. And by every morning, I mean on my birthday. You know, I mean, and that was just, I could not do that when I was in my 20s. And I don't, I don't hate myself. I had a lot of fun in my 20s. I went out and did stuff and met people and fell in love and started bands and, you know, had adventures and stuff. But when I came back to writing after having run a small business, successful small business for a while and had working relationships and all the rest of it, it just seemed like, oh, that, you know, I could be spending 30 hours a week writing or I could be spending 30 hours a week chasing down somebody else's problems. And it just seemed like so clear that if I wanted to be a writer, I was probably going to have to write, you know. <laughs> um, well, that, I don't know why that was not clear to me in my 20s, but it, it, I did think that I was going to write something that was going to be great and that would be that, you know. That, was, that would be all over. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of different questions. Some of us up here are, are, are making a living in ways that involve the web. Um, and I'm totally curious about how that interfaces with your writing and, and also how the hell do you get paid? So, anybody want to try? Go ahead. Well, yeah, you guys start. I don't know. Okay. Um, one really awesome thing about having a job that's web-based um, for me is that I can work anywhere. So mostly I work here in Missoula, but I, it also means that like this May, I'm going to work in Chicago for all of May and get to be back in, in theater and writing and, and doing work there. So for me, like the flexibility of, being, of having a job that actually pays bills, I was thinking about all the jobs I've had too. Like I was a lunch lady, <laughs> I painted houses, I was a medical test subject, which actually pays really well. <laughs> so I've done a lot of things too, but this job, like, I wouldn't say that it's flexible in that I have all my time. Like, I devote a lot of time to it. Um, 
but having the, the freedom to, to be able to change locations means that a lot more opportunities stay open versus having a job that ties you to one place. Yeah. Julia? Uh, yeah, alongside th that, I am extremely grateful that I work for a company that allows me to continue to live in Missoula because I love this town and uh, I wouldn't have this job if I hadn't loved this town to begin with. Um, but on the flip side of that, I sort of hate that it's an internet job because I like have my phone in my pocket at all times, worried that I'm missing something. Um, and it's hard for me to stop the workday at 5 p.m. Um, but it also, you know, there's so much back and forth. I was also actually a little bit sick this week, and so I just worked from home for two days and was able to still be productive and join the staff meeting via Skype. Um, how we make money is, I guess, primarily through our sponsorship, sponsorship sales um, of the event because we're the industry leader uh, for this type of event now and people want to be there. YouTube is our title sponsor. Uh, we have crazy, like Mars Chocolate Company is coming in this year, Kia, like all these people are just throwing money at YouTube because they, they think, they know that this is, you know, the next TV or the next radio or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's that and ticket sales and then that sort of trickles down to me and that's what pays my salary. So uh, I guess that's event specific. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a very I have very mixed feelings about the internet, and of course, it allows me to live here in Montana, which I love, and have my bosses be in New York. And you know, I think many of us. Um, I mean, it, what you guys were saying that it allows you to live sort of anywhere and have mobility and all of that. But I think um, you know, and I think writers now feel a real pressure to be on social media, and you hear about having a platform, and I need to be on Twitter and I think that can be good for some writers and not so great for others. If you're very charming like Alice, you get work from it. But if you are not so charming, I think it distills your personality in this very concentrated, terrible way where other people end up muting you on Twitter. And and honestly, I have I, I have I'm not I am on Twitter, I'm not on it that that much, but I have followed some of my heroes, I'm not gonna name names on Twitter, and then ended up unfollowing them because it was a very you know, it was just wasn't, I didn't like their voice on there. I, I, and I, I just, you know, people go on there and complain. And I think you have to be very careful how you use social media, I guess is what I'm saying. Because people read it and it can be an incredible turn off to the people that you don't want to be turning off. And that's not just bosses, that's fans, that's readers, that's, you know, colleagues, that's your support system. So there's that. The other thing is I think it can be incredibly distracting and in a, in a really pernicious destructive way for a writer's mind. And this I've experienced myself. I, I find it can be very addictive. And I noticed that when I was first using it, I was kind of using it the way I used to smoke, where like I get to a great place in a piece, oh, I'll just go check Twitter or something. Or I, like, or I go on the internet, you know, whatever it is. Or, you know, I'm having a hard time. Rather than push through it, I'll go on the internet. And then a friend of mine who is um, you know, a therapist, I was telling him about it, and he was like, how does your muse feel when you're breaking up with her like that? And I was like, oh, that's, a w I'm never doing that again. Like, that's a terrible way of putting it, you know? And I have noticed this trend of a lot of writers that I admire that they're getting off social media. They're not, they're not on it that much. They're not, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think you really need to ask yourself and maybe some people who can give you a, a really honest answer. How do I come off on social media? Because if you're Oscar Wilde of Twitter, that is great. But if you're not, it, I think it can be harmful. That's just my two cents. And I may be aging myself by saying that. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree that uh, social media in particular and the internet in general is immensely destructive to workflow. Um, you have to be able to turn that off um, and unplug your router for a couple hours at a time. Uh, that being said, if the internet goes out of my house, I'm out of the business for the day. Um, like it's, uh, it absolutely enables uh, my, my work, um, not least because it enables an economy of scale. Uh, if I lived in New York City, like 
I could probably get by as a professional writer, but it would it would be touch and go. Um, whereas the internet really enables me to live in a place that's less expensive um, and still still make East Coast West Coast contracts. Um, so I think that's very valuable. I also think uh, Twitter is an extremely well a potentially useful publishing platform. Um, unlike, in a way that Facebook even is not, um, because at this time it is not governed by an algorithm. Um, things that people like on Twitter can get shared uh, as much as people want to share them. Uh, and that's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, because there are uh, <laughs> lots, <laughs> lots of writers I once them. admired until I followed them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and some whom I still admire but are kind of funny. Uh, follow Joyce Carol Oates on Twitter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you can just see her using the phone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, excuse me. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought because I became fascinated by Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> um, but there are, to be very technical about it, there are two times of day when you should be on Twitter flogging things that you've written and not sold but published on the internet uh, if you want to use it. Those times are in the morning, like between 9 and 10 a.m. when office drones have come to their jobs but are not working. Uh, and are therefore like obsessively looking at Twitter, uh, and then 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, when people are commuting home uh, on public transportation and not in their cars. Um, those are moments when you can use Twitter for punctuated effect, uh, and the rest of the day it's your false friend, in my experience. The rest of the day put on antisocial, that, that uh, blocking thing. Uh, or um, self-control. Or freedom software. Yeah. There are a number of apps that you can use. For some reason. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will, I'll d just say, I mean, for me, the internet is more of a labor of love. Uh, I don't make a lot of my money on the internet. Most of my money comes from teaching children poetry on a mountain in Southern California. But, um, and actually a lot of the places that I write for are online. They pay, you know, $150, $200 here and there. And if I were pitching them all the time and, you know, sending them three articles a week, I mean a month, uh, that would be one thing. But um, I feel like I've, it's, I think that social media and also writing for online outlets are, is kind of a tool that you have to execute in certain ways. I mean, for me, my goal always with nonfiction was to have a book and create a collection of essays that were co coherent um, and not to, at least at this point, make my living writing essays that to me were not interesting. So, or whatever. So I think it's something where the internet, you can use, I mean the internet, but you know, connections that you make on the internet, social media, uh, and you know, living in a weird place and working remotely, is something you can execute for multiple ends. You can do it to make your living. It's a lot harder of a hustle. Or you can do it to kind of meet people and get your name out there. I mean, it seems, it seems to me that the internet is, has wiped out the ability to get paid for your work. Um, at the same time, it's created a ton of opportunity to, do, to get your name out there. It's a really a two-edged sword. I mean, it's, I used to do a lot of magazine work, and I used to get a dollar a word for it. And those days, I mean, they're, they're still out there, but the competition for those things is, is fast and furious. And I hear people, you know, getting paid a couple of cents a word for internet publications, and it just freaks me out. I mean, I mean, you can, you know, only eat top ramen for so long. But I think that for someone just starting out, having a social media presence and maybe publishing some stuff on the web in places that doesn't that, that, that don't pay particularly well and not counting on that as an income stream is a way to get your name out there or, <clears throat> as Tim would say, I think, your brand. Um, and that's come up a few times, but I mean, the, you know, this comes up with the, with the uh, social media stuff. It's like you, what you guys are talking about is safeguarding the brand. You don't want to put people off, you know. And before, when it was a print medium, you didn't have to worry about it. It was just whatever was on the page. But now, you know, some, I'm sure somebody out there is hating me right now for posting all those corgi pictures on the Facebook. <laughs> but, uh, we got about 10. <laughs> that's all I do. Me and my daughter post corgi pictures. I, I do the, like, sad face. <laughs> 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 We've got about 10 minutes left. Do, do any of you have questions? Yeah. 
I'm curious about um, now it's so much easier to get read if you're publishing on Scary Mommy or Jezebel. Sorry. Now it's so much easier to get read if you're publishing on Scary Mommy or Jezebel or something online versus like the Iowa Review. Like, are you helping your platform by publishing in some of the like the, you know, lesser um, literary online platforms versus trying to get into lit mags? Like, are you? Are, is it does it make sense to make a shift away from? submitting all your good stuff to a print journal that no one else is going to read versus an online one that you're not going to get paid for, but you might get a lot of Facebook shares or something. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think that uh, I think that we're in a golden age of like lifestyle publishing, uh, thanks to the internet. Um, the success of motherhood-oriented sites are a good example of that. Um, almost any identifiable niche uh, has been heavily mined by the internet. And I think that uh, those sites pay poorly, and certainly we, we often read a lot of embarrassing stuff in them, um, but I think they compare very favorably with literary journals um, in terms of, one, uh, actually paying you a little bit, um, which is nice, uh, and two, uh, being very widely read. Uh, the value of publishing in a literary journal is, I would say, the curation of that audience. Uh, agents read literary journals. Uh, editors of literary journals read literary journals. Uh, and so do people who are attached to MFA programs. Um, but that is an ultimately limited audience. I think there's no reason to ignore that audience, but I do think it's a mistake to shepherd your brand by staying away from bust or, or scary mommy, which I've just heard about and has really captured my imagination. Um, I think the, uh, even those trashy, like the first uh, couple years that I was writing professionally, I wrote regularly for a men's interest mega site called Crave Online, um, an, an evil publication for, for idiots. Um, and uh, that has in no way damaged my career. Um, I, people forget what is written in Crave Online the day after it is published. Um, what it did do uh, was allow me to develop relationships with editors who eventually moved on to better publications um, and also forced me to practice making deadline on stuff that I hated writing. Um, I wrote about calorie counting and fitness for a long time. Yeah, and as you can see, I'm an Adonis. Um, so. I think that there is there's very little bad work out there, um, short of bomb plans or like some sort of like racist or otherwise like morally reprehensible work. I think pretty much any work you take is going to advance your career, if for no other reason than contributing to your rent. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No worries. I just don't. I don't want to. No, don't be like. Yeah, <laughs> I I disagree a little bit. If I, if that's okay. I mean, I think that. Um, I think you're, I, I, I do agree that um, it's okay to write for, you know, Scary Mommy or whatever, um, because one of the beautiful things about social media, which I should have said when I was talking about it, is that the good stuff really does rise to the top and get read. I mean, some, some really terrible, salacious things do too, but the reason I like it is because I discover writers and pieces that I never would have discovered if I hadn't been on Twitter, like a piece in some... Because even at literary journals, a lot of them, after a time, they put their essays up on social media. So I discover things that I never would have encountered, you know, just reading the New York Times in the morning and then reading the five things I subscribe to or whatever, or talking to my friends. Um, so I, I think it's a mistake to think like, okay, I'm not going to write for literary journals because these things have uh, you know such a social media presence or a greater audience or whatever because I think you do actually want to think about audience which is that you know on the one hand you do want a wide readership for your pieces that's fun why are you doing this if you don't want to communicate with people etc on the other hand you also want the right people to read your stuff because that is what advances your career you know, and, and, and that's what it gets you if you want to write a book, if you want, and, and also because it's so much more rewarding to write literary pieces than it is to write something for the other com more commercial places. At least that's my opinion. And so, um, you know, 
sometimes I'll write things for, for, I think I'm getting sick as I'm sitting here speaking. I honestly, I feel the cold forming. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm like, I have a stuffy nose. Um, anyway, so I mean, I've written for both and, and you know, I guess, I guess to sort of, to sum up what I'm saying is, I think if you're gonna write for Scary Mommy or whatever these other sites are, you should still do, do your best work that you can do within the parameters of that particular venue. I never write anything that's like just dashed off because I don't care about this, th this place where it's getting published. Because you know someone might read it and say, this is a really great piece, it's in Scary Mommy, that's kind of strange. I've never read this publication, so I don't know. But it's in a, you know, it's in a, it's in an, it's, I wouldn't expect to th find this quality of writing in this venue, they might think, but you can feel good that you did your best work no matter where you're publishing it because we all have to get paid. On the other hand, in a literary journal, you can really be experimental with form in a way that you can't in some of these other places. I mean, you, a lot of times when you're writing in magazines, you are really put in, a, in the corset, so to speak, of the magazine. You have to write in a certain style or voice or format. And you don't have to do that with literary magazines. And that is sometimes worth getting just paid $150 or having fewer people read it because that's like where your soul comes from, you know? I had a question to say, did we lose the microphone? Yeah, yeah here you go, because question. I was trying oh, to avoid. Uh, this one's sick. unclean. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, that there's no wrong way to do it in my opinion. Um, as I think you know, Kima, <laughs> but that uh, like I was looking at like Eula Biss's um, great collection, Notes from No Man's Land, and I was r realizing, oh, a lot of her essays, they were published in like Ninth Letter or S the Southern Humanities Review, you know, really, you know, lit mags that are at grad programs, you know, that we consider like quite traditional, don't have a huge, um, you know, distribution, um, and that book is, you know, everywhere, and all of those essays are brilliant and beautiful. But I also think a lot of people are publishing, I mean, I think that there is a difference between publishing something on Guernica and publishing something on Crave Online, um, yeah, among online uh, outlets. I mean, and to me, I remember when I was publishing poetry in traditional literary journals, like I remember I published two poems in Field, which was really exciting. It's a wonderful journal. And I ended up feeling like I had just taken my poems and buried them in a hole where no one would ever see them. Um, there's no distribution. I never even got a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sort of like they had paid me $50 for no one to ever read my poems. <laughs> um, so, and that kind of changed my perspective to a certain extent into wanting to at least publish in places where people were going to see it, a magazine with good distribution or something on the internet. I remember I published a piece on the Paris Review's daily blog about Richard Hugo that I actually, that was, um, Four years ago now, I still receive emails from his former students, his former colleagues, people who've read um, this piece, and it meant something to them. And that's one of the things I'm proudest of. And that wouldn't happen if I had published it in, you know, one of these smaller journals in the Iowa Review or something like that. Those people would never find me, and I wouldn't have that experience. I think we're out of time. I think we're out of time. Um, let's continue this conversation over cocktails at the Finn and Porter uh, Bar. We'll be over there in a couple minutes. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.